My name is Georgia and I'm a proud Wawan woman from the Gomorrah Nation. Hi, I'm Shani and I'm from the Wiradjuri Nation. We always acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that we own. So as a proud Wawan woman from the Gomorrah Nation, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and thank them for allowing us to walk on their lands today and to share their stories. Now, this building behind us is quite recognisable, but what you might not know is the name of the land that the Sydney Opera House sits on. That's right, this beautiful building is situated on what is known as today as Benlong Point. But did you know this place hasn't always been known as Benlong Point? Big history this place. Aboriginal people have had a connection with this country for over 60,000 years. That's a long time. And today we call this tour Gwani Wollama, which means to tell and return in the Gadigal language. Yes, telling stories and returning to the past. Now, Georgia, I'd love to do a quick activity with you, if you could close your eyes. Yep. Because the story of Benalong Point begins back before the Sydney Opera House was here, when there was no circular quay, no cars, no ferries, no trains, no buildings. The story begins before white people had stepped onto the shores and back before the Aboriginal people of the Eora Nation called this place Jubagali. So have a think about what types of things you might see way, way back before the Sydney Opera House was here and now opening your eyes. I'd love to hear about some of the things that you experienced. I think I would have seen animals, mm -hmm. trees, bush, rocks, Definitely no buildings and definitely no Sydney Opera House. Great, all of these things you've described, the air, the plants, the animals, they all make up what we call country. Country is very important to Aboriginal people. Country is the land, the animals, the air we breathe in. It is everything and has always been connected to our spirituality and beliefs, our dreaming. The dreaming is very important to the Gadigal people. Dreaming is the law. Dreaming is explaining what things are, how they came to be, the rules for how we must live. We're now going to show you a short video of what this country looked like before white settlement, the land of the Gadigal, and how this country is formed from an Aboriginal perspective. Along the way, we'll also hear a little bit about the dreaming. The dreaming or creation time is when our ancestor spirits moved across the land and created life, passed down laws and made important features in the landscape. In most stories of the dreaming, the ancestral beings came to the earth in human form and as they moved through the land, they created the animals, plants, rivers, rocks and other features of the land that we know today. They also created the relationships between Aboriginal clan groups and our relationship to the land and to the animals. Once the ancestor spirits had finished creating the world, they lost their human shapes and changed into trees, the stars, rocks, watering holes and other objects. These are the sacred places of our Aboriginal culture and have special properties. Because the ancestors did not disappear at the end of the dreaming, but remained in their sacred sites, the dreaming is never ending, linking the past and the present, the people and the land. Stories of the dreaming pass on important knowledge, cultural values and belief systems from one generation to the next. Using song, dance, painting and storytelling to express the dreaming stories, Aboriginal people have maintained a link with the old ways to the new ways of today. Alright, let's take a look around as what is known as Benalong Point today. What can we see? Sydney Harbour Bridge, Luna Park, we can see buildings, we can also see ferries, Circular Quay Station, trains. 
this place looks pretty different to the natural landscape that we saw in the video. Yeah, it does. And as we were saying earlier, this place has always been a really significant place of gathering for the Aboriginal people. And the reason it was so special was because of the harbour, which provided a source of food and also water. And the Aboriginal people would do this thing called Malgro, which is fishing. That's right. They would sit on this little island and eat their Malgro fish and gadyan, cockles, and jalga, mussels. All right, let's eat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yum. Now, the Gadikul people would always, after they finished eating, would always throw the shells mm -hmm. into a big pile. All right, let's throw them. Now, these piles continue to grow bigger and bigger, and we now refer to these piles of shells as middens. Now, middens were sometimes 13 metres high and several hundred metres long, which is as big as a football field, so that's pretty wow. big, hey? Yeah. And these uh, midden piles are really important because they prove to us that this was a place where people would come together and where people would gather at Jubagali. Now, they're also really important because they let us know that the Aboriginal people were living on the land sustainably, which means that they would look at the top of the pile to see what they'd eaten a lot of last season, and then they would know to leave that alone for the next season so they didn't overfish one species. That's pretty clever. Can you imagine the gatherings here, the stories told, the rituals, the ceremonies, the corroboree, the teachings and learnings that took place here? Yeah, I've always wondered what it would be like to be a member of the Gadigal clan. And we actually have a video now that will show you a little bit more about a day in the life of a Gadigal person. Let's imagine a day in the life of a Gadigal person. How did the people live with the land? You've got to remember that every day was different. It was really dependent on what the weather was like, the time of the day, the season. Like all Aboriginal clan groups across Australia, whether it was in the older days or even today, people moved. They had their summer homelands and winter homelands and they would move across their tribal boundaries. So if it was cold down by the harbour, they would move to the warmer caves and rock shelters and further into the forest for the seasonal crops. As they moved, they were able to navigate where they were going by looking at the stars. They could read the land. The land was part of them. The sun would tell them what the time was and what season it was. They could read the environment for food, water and shelter. So they would know when a particular wattle turned a colour, it was time to move inland. Tracks or markings in the sand would tell them what sort of animals were living there. A lot of the food came from the harbour. The waters of Sydney Harbour were the women's domain. They provided most of the food for their families. The Gadigal women had amazing skills in fishing, swimming, diving and canoeing. Every day in all types of weather, and often at night too, women would be out in little bark canoes called nawis. They would manage these canoes with small children, even babies, where they would tackle fish through rough surf. They would have little fires in their canoes, lit on clay pads for keeping warm and for cooking, and they would sing to each other to keep time when paddling. Nothing would go to waste. If you killed an animal, everything would be used. So the Gadigal would go back to Jubagali, 
where they'd been eating those oysters and other shellfish and chucking them into a pile. And they would collect the shells and fashion them into sharp tools like hooks and axes. Gadigal men used shells to make the barb for their spears for hunting across the grasslands. The Gadigal used to eat vegetables and fruit such as warrigal greens, kangaroo apples, lily pilly, grape cherries and native yam, which tastes a bit like sweet potato. They also had ferns such as bracken, which was pulped and then made into a sort of bread. First though, it needed to be soaked, sometimes for days, in the running streams and washed to remove the poisons and toxins. The women and girls were kept busy identifying, collecting, cleaning and making use of the abundance of vegetables and fruits. They fashioned mats and baskets out of some of the plants, lamandra, Galgadia, the grass tree, and bulrushes, a painstaking and time-consuming task. Gadigal people had their own language, and like all Aboriginal languages, it was not written down. It was an oral language. Stories were also communicated through other forms, including rock, tree, and wood carvings, charcoal drawings, symbols, icons, symbolic paintings, X-ray art, stencils and soil etchings. These markings all told stories or were indicators or roadmaps. Message sticks were used to cross tribal boundaries so that you would have a safe crossing, a little bit like how we use a passport today. This is where all the fishing happened. It's so interesting how the Gadigal women did most of the fishing. They would go out onto the Nawis canoes out on the harbour and try and catch a mangrove fish. It's so cool also how the Gadigal people really knew how to recycle and they used their shells for lots of useful things like axes and spears. And the plants mentioned, some of them are still around today. Like lily pillies, the tall trees of pink little fruits, the Gadigal people call these Daguba. And warrigal greens, they're also still around today. Warrigal greens are in the cord Nalong Diang. Now we're standing at the northern end of the Sydney Opera House and I'd love for you to all put on your imagination caps and we are going to go back in time 235 years and pretend that you're a member of the Gadigal clan. So we're down here, we might be fishing, playing, we're with our family, minding our own business and then all of a sudden these 11 tall ships come sailing through Sydney Heads heading straight towards you and they are far bigger than any bark canoe you've ever seen. So have a think about how that might feel. And then the next day, 1300 white people, they step off the boats onto your gathering place, onto Jubagali, and they start clearing the land, setting up camp and pushing you away from your source of food, your shade trees, pushing you away from your home. So how do you think that might have made you feel, Georgia? I reckon it must be like someone walking through your front door and going to your fridge and eating all your food and going to your bedroom and making a mess of all your things. Yeah, it would have been really difficult. Now, this was the arrival of the First Fleet, which arrived in 1787. And on board the First Fleet were Marines, doctors, convicts, women, children, and the first governor of New South Wales, Governor Arthur Phillip. And he was given the job of opening up talks between the white settlement and the Gadigal clan. But the Gadigal people were a little unsure of this strange new tribe that arrived and was similar in size to their own tribe. When average people first saw Governor Arthur Phillip, they referred to him as a leader. This was because he had missing teeth in the exact same spot as young Eora men had moved as part of initiation ceremony. 
Yeah, there's this other story, Georgia, about how the Gadigal clan, at first, when they saw the first fleet, they went out to meet them, thinking that they were the long ago dead ancestors returning from the past. And the story goes that the Gadigal clan members would paint their skin with white ochre during burial ceremonies. So Governor Arthur Phillip, with his teeth missing, his white skin and his white wig, indeed would have looked like an ancestor from long ago returning from the dead. Now I've got a question for you Shani. Yeah. So if the the land that the Sydney Opera House sits on is Benelong Point, mm -hmm. who was Benelong? Benelong is a really important part of our history. He was one of the first Indigenous Australians to live amongst the British. He learnt English, he actually visited England and lived to tell the tale. And he forged links and played a really important role in creating understanding between the White Settlement and the Gadigal clan group and also all of the other clan groups from all of the surrounding nations. So he's a really important person. We've actually got a video now with a little bit more information all about Benelong. My name is Walara Wari Benelong and I would like to tell you my story. It's 1789. Things weren't great here in Warrani. My people weren't very happy. Governor Philip was getting a bit desperate. He needed someone to help him understand us. Our customs, our language, how we survived in this land. So he kidnapped some of us. Well, me actually. Me and Colby, a warrior from the Gadigal clan. We were in Kiami, beautiful place. And along come a group of white men in their boats holding up some real nice looking fish. Hey fellas! That's some real nice looking fish! And you know what? They tricked us, those white fellas. When we came near the boats, they dragged us in, tied us up, and took us back to that big government house. Colby escaped pretty quickly, but I was there for another six months. Over time though, I started thinking and realised that not everything about these white men was so bad. The food was okay. I didn't mind wearing their clothes either. I didn't think it would hurt to start learning their language and providing some important information about the Eora clans of this area. Things like our language and customs, that sort of stuff. Even so, when it came down to it, I was still a prisoner, so I took the opportunity to escape when I could. Now, and this is cool, you know what I did? I pretended that I had a stomach cramp and I was going to like, you know, pretend to vomit. They took off my leg chains and I took off, jumped the nearest fence and I was out of there. They didn't see me again until I was ready. About three months later, this dead whale beached up at Kiami. A big mob of Eora people gathered there and we were all feasting on it. I sent Philip a chunk of the blubber, pretty good tucker, you know, and he came over to Kiami. Some big stuff went down and Philip was being in the shoulder. While history is going to argue whether this was payback for the kidnappers or not, it is not for me to comment today. But for my people, once payback occurs, the crime is forgiven and life moves on. One thing that did happen is that it cleared the air. When Governor Philip got better, we started talking again. And I came back to Warrini. But I wasn't in chains. I was a diplomat. You know what that meant? I could help my people. Let me think of an example. Ah, my hut, built right here where the Sydney Opera House sits today. It was a bit like an embassy. You know, a place where you could hold meetings with tribal elders from across the districts. I would set out complaints against the settlers and requested demands on their behalf. Meanwhile, Governor Philip and I, we started to respect each other. To show people that, I started calling him Pina, which means father. And he called me Duro, his son. Now, in December 1792, Arthur set sail back to England. He asked a fellow young clan member, Yamaro Wani, and I to go back with him. We were on that boat for six months, half a year. Eventually we arrived in this crazy place called London. Everything looked pretty strange to us, and people looked at us strangely as well. We stayed in a fancy place called Mayfair. The man that we stayed with was a musician, so we shared music. His and ours was so different. Listen to this. We were singing in our own language about our missed loved ones back home. 
The cool thing about this song, that it was the first indigenous song from Australia that was notated. You know, written down in those little black music notes. This music score has been hidden in a library in England for hundreds of years and has only recently been discovered by an Australian historian. How cool is that? On the whole though, I didn't like London much. Me and Yamrawani both got sick. It was so cold and of course we missed our people and our country. It was a really hard time when Yamrawani caught pneumonia and died. He passed away from country, away from family. I couldn't give him the ceremonial burial and mourning that he should have had. In the end, I was gone for three years and I could not believe my eyes when I got back. White people were going around calling my country the colony and there was buildings everywhere. It was really different. I ended up leaving Warani and spent the rest of my life at Putney, living on the lands of my friend, a freed white man called James Squire. Wow, what a life Benelong lives. My favourite part of the story was a bit about the music. I find it so amazing how the sheet of music of Benelong's song was hidden in a library in London for hundreds of years and was only just discovered by a historian back in 2012. Yeah, Benelong had such an incredible life and he's such an important part of our Australian history. And there are so many other incredible stories of Indigenous Australians just like Benelong, but unfortunately we just don't have time to cover them all today. But what we have talked about is the beginning of time through to the dreaming, a day in the life of the Gadigal, white settlement, and now we find ourselves here at the Sydney Opera House. And it's really important to remember that this was once Jubagali, that tiny island completely cut off from the mainland. And also at one point, Benelong's hut was here. So this place has such a rich history and it's had a lot of different names and purposes over time. At one point, it was known as Cattle Point. This was because this was where all the horses and cows were stabled after a brought from England. Later on, the name changed again, this time Lime Burners. Remember how the Gadigal people created the middens of all the shells after they ate all their oysters? Well, later on, the convict women gathered these shells and crushed them up for the lime, and then they burnt them to the mortar, which is like a cement, to create the first ever government house. There was also a fort built here as well to house tram sheds. It's funny how a place gets a different name depending on what is happening at the time. And as the city built up, all of the rubble and landfill from all of the construction was dropped into the channel that separated Jubagali from the mainland. And over time, they became connected and it got its new name, this time, Benelong Point. That's right. And as the city continued to grow and evolve, it had all of the things that a city needed, but everyone was feeling like there was just something missing. So it was decided to build the Sydney Opera House. And after 16 years and $102 million, here it is, the Sydney Opera House. Now, Georgia, when you take a look at the Sydney Opera House and its colours, patterns, shapes, what type of things do you see? I see a shell. I also see sails off a ship. Yeah, that's great. Sometimes other people see shark fins or shark teeth and also waves. And in his original design notes, the architect Jorn Utzen also referenced those midden shells that we talked about earlier. So some people also say that the Opera House is a modern day midden, which is pretty cool. You know, it's really funny how so much has changed, but also in a lot of ways, so much has stayed the same because this is still a place of gathering where stories are shared and told. Gwani Wolama, remember to tell and return. It's been so much fun sharing and telling stories with you about the beautiful culture, history of this amazing gathering place. Yeah, and the Gadigal people don't like to say goodbye. They always say that they'll see you later. And the way to do that in Gadigal is Yanu Yanu. So, Yanu Yanu. yanu.